question of the day. We have Juan Pablo Atero with us, and he will be talking about his experiences in numerous organizations carving the way for inclusion. So I will take I'll take you away from the yep. um, pin there and and there we have Juan Pablo. There we are. Hi, Claire. Hi. Thank you so much for being with us today. And we're really looking forward to hearing your experiences in terms of a little bit about you and then also the ways you've helped carve a pathway with organizations to support inclusion. So here's a challenge. If we leave with a one, two, three, the perfect answer, we're happy. <laughs> and of okay. course we know it's it's not quite that easy. Joanne, just to check, uh, there's no slides to share, is that correct? No, it's, it's correct. Absolutely perfect. It's, it's more gonna be a talk between us and I just wanna share my, uh, my experience in uh, top leader companies and uh, doing uh, diversity and inclusion. I was former diversity and inclusion uh, officer for Daimler Mercedes-Benz here in Mexico and uh, other top leader companies. So uh, I would like uh, to talk more about personnel. I, I already have seen all the lecturers from today and they are like uh, very professional and uh, how to go there. So I wanna go deeper uh, inside us. So uh, let's start if you want. That sounds absolutely amazing. And this is the last session of the day. So deeper is a brilliant way to end today's sessions. So just before we start, Tell us a little bit about where you are. Tell us a little bit about you. And also, well, what got you into this particular area, inclusion? I'm Juan Pablo from Mexico, as you said. And uh, for the last 10 years, I have been dedicated for uh, social responsibility and diversity and inclusion uh, for uh, world top companies, like I said, uh, Mercedes-Benz, uh, that uh, everybody knows the brand in all the world. I have been in um, Edelman, that is the biggest uh, relation, public relations agency with clients such as uh, Home Depot, PepsiCo, um, 3M, very uh, global clients, but I have been working uh, with a Grupo Bimbo that is the biggest bakery in the world and uh, it's Mexican. So uh, I have a degree, a master degree in social responsibility, but uh, I've been working in diversity and inclusion because I have a cer cerebral policy. I was born with that. And then uh, I found my vocation through giving others the opportunity that I have. So, um, First of all, I started working in um, sports journalism in a uh, first division soccer club here in Mexico. But after that, I had the opportunity to enter um, to Bimbo. As I said, uh, Bimbo has like uh, 100,000 and like 100,000 employees around the world. Um, when I got in up to 10 years ago, and then uh, that's why, because uh, it's a bit uh, uh, an opportunity to be better in all terms. So, and I, I want to, to tell the audience that uh, if they have any inquiry or question, uh, we are open to, to hear it. Perfect, absolutely. Some will be speaking out, uh, they can take off their mute and also I'll be keeping an eye on the chat box as well. So I'm also curious, I know 
you studied this area, when did it first become something that you were then using with organizations? Was that when you left university? No, it's because um, I was part of the problem or issue, or I was part of the, of the people that wanted to work and uh, I didn't find work, even though I have gone to one of the uh, private schools here in Mexico and uh, I have always had uh, regular studies and uh, I had all the credentials to have um, good pay work, but I don't have it. So I found that there was a problem there and then I entered to Bimbo, that uh, it's an iconic um, corporation here in Mexico and Latin America. And then um, I found that uh, I got there because a, pro a program they had for inclusion, but uh, they did it like a charity almost. And then uh, they give you very little works or positions like uh, starting positions. So. Uh, they hope you to be there all your life. And I said, I wanted to have better position and I have to, I want to have better earning because sometimes uh, people think that uh, because you are in a vulnerable group, you don't want to have more money or you don't want to have a house or get married or pay for all the things that you have to pay. So, uh, I was very identified with the previous talk because all those things uh, were uh, built in the last decade. If you were, um, at least in Mexico, if you are, um, if you look for all the things that are happening here 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you cannot imagine that. So um, I want to build this culture, but, um, it's not only for one person, a lot of person, a lot of people needs to be convinced that uh, it's the only way to, to, to success. I love it. And it was interesting when you're saying about, you know, some people think certain groups don't want marriage or house. I'm also thinking there, some people think that certain groups are not interested in a career and education, which, you know, in one second, I think this is absolutely crazy. How can that be? And then it is real. Well, I think that uh, if you change the beginning of, of the story, you change of the whole the story. The whole story. So, uh, if you want a real inclusion culture, you need to begin since the kindergarten, and you need to begin uh, from house because um, sometimes you go to the big corporations that are the ones that can make uh, this effort. So um, they look for qualified people, but they don't find it because in, in places like Mexico, you don't have access to education because you have uh, some uh, condition whatever you wanted to call, like uh, you are like, uh, you have Indian heritage or you are like, uh, I don't know, darker skin, you, you are a human. So if, if you are not a man, Caucasian, heterosexual in Mexico, you are uh, a vulnerable person. And uh, even white man person will be vulnerable because in the, uh, best case, they will get old. So old people is also vulnerable. So um, we all will be vulnerable in some time of our lives. So that's why we need to begin educating uh, our children uh, in the diversity and inclusion culture, because if you don't, uh, so. At, at some point, those kids will be uh, the men that would be the leaders of tomorrow. And then um, they will do what you teach now. 
It's just so interesting the way you're tying together so many of the topics that have come up throughout the day. I, I thank you for that because it, it just, it really does bring in the gender and the ages. That's why, that, that's why I, I'm, I'm the last one from today. There we go. It was, <laughs> it was perfectly set up. We knew that. Absolutely. So say more, Joanne, about the projects in the organizations and the way you've really impacted them. Well, um, the first thing uh, I want to uh, say is that uh, Chekhov used to say that uh, if you want to be global, talk about your town. So uh, I think that I, and I have heard in all the, in all the before um, um, talks from today, a lot of things that I, I have been reflected. So if, if it happened to them, it must have, have, have happened to me. And if it happens to me here in Mexico, it, it must have happened in all around the world because at the end, we are all the same. So uh, we have almost the same problems. So um, it depends where you have to, where do you want to, to impact? For me, uh, start with inclusion. It starts from the beginning, and uh, and then um, we more we must understand that, and uh, not for being different, we should systematically change unconscious bias, assuming that uh, something that um, that uh, I think is um, is the thing that it is. So I I need to think, start thinking that the uh, giving the other one the possibility to be right is um, is listening. Listening is the possibility. Give the other one. Sorry, I, I get a little confused. Give the other one uh, the possibility to be okay. So, uh, in inclusion, first of all, we have to to listen, and then. We have to ask if we don't we don't know we don't have to assume. We need to to ask that uh, if the other people it's okay and uh, if the other people um, needs help. So uh, if you want to start a project like uh, I started the diversity and inclusion office in Daimler or in other uh, companies. The first thing I want to, to say is uh, what I want to change, which one is my problem, because every organization has uh, different problems. For, for example, automotive, automotive, uh, automobile industry has a lot of uh, gender issues, but it doesn't have like um, heritage or other problems. And um, in public relations um, industry, we have a lot of gender uh, diversity and LGTV uh, inclusion and everything. So the, the first thing you have to do is a uh, diagnosis and uh, you have to, to look at uh, radiography or um, X-ray map in your organization. So, uh, you can do like a uh, dress at your um, your size. So um, it's the first thing you have to do that uh, not all organizations are the same. So you have to ask what do you want to, to change? And after that, you have to start um, working. So um, I think that uh, inclusion, it's a path that uh, has no end. So you need to understand that, that you will never get a goal. Maybe if you are in sales or you are in other um, parts of the company, you know where you want to be and you know numbers where you want to have. But in inclusion, never is enough because uh, there is something more to do. So the thing is that 
you have to have in mind that it's just just uh, keep going. And uh, when you get from one goal, you have to keep going more and more and more until the time uh, you don't need it. But uh, it must take like hundred years, like uh, they said in a in a previous talk. So. It's amazing. So it is really, it's a journey and it's a unique journey for every organization. And one thing I'm hearing for you also is what's the purpose? What do they want and what do they want to create? And that will help decide the best journey to get there. So then, um, first of all, we need to sensibilize our uh, workers, um, telling them that the inclusion starts from, from uh, it's an internal attitude and uh, the first benefit is for me. So uh, sometimes we think that uh, if we accept other people, different people, we're making them a favor. And the real thing is that uh, the first people that benefit it's us because uh, we open our mind and uh, we are better and we have a bigger uh, box because uh, I have always heard on the on the work think out of the box so um, you cannot think out of the box if you don't have other boxes to look so uh, I have, when I have been working on multicultural uh, companies, if all the people in the room is the same, you will have the same result. And if all the people in the room is different, or some of them are different, we will have uh, different per perspectives. And then uh, we will reach different clients and the business will run better. So uh, how come we, we want to reach all the population and we will uh, have all the market if we don't have all the populations and all the people inside our, our business? Makes perfect sense, absolutely. And uh, after that, we... Uh, most give everyone the opportunity to show their qualities. And uh, before uh, meeting us in work, there were a lot of people that uh, make sure that they have the um, capabilities to be there. Because sometimes when we, when we see someone um, black or uh, in wheelchair or something like uh, how come he's here? Well, I don't know, but uh, he must know something because I don't know a company that gives away money for free. If, if they are uh, hiring someone, it's because he does or she does something well. So uh, open your mind and give all, everyone in your company the opportunity to show them the capabilities and their skills. So then you will change uh, the view before uh, judging someone uh, without knowing. And then um, there is, at, at least in Mexico, uh, we are very used to say, uh, well, he is the boss. And uh, I have to be respectful because he is the boss. And. Uh, in work, we have two axes and the, the vertical, there, there are hierarchies, but in the horizontal, we're all the same. And then it must be the boss and we will, he must have some um, better increase and everything, but uh, you have to, to never um, lose that uh, we are all people and we have to be, uh, treated in the same way. So it doesn't matter your position in the company, you have to be, to, to treat everyone uh, the, the same way because you don't know that uh, 
the intern for today will be the CEO of tomorrow. So uh, I think that uh, that's a real good way to start treating all, all the workers like persons. Beautiful. It's just treating people like human beings. And it, that is the essence. It's what we've all got in common. Yeah, so um, in in the um, inclusion way, I have uh, figured it out that uh, it's not about presence, it's about representation, because uh, sometimes they say, um, well, uh, we have a wheelchair use man, and uh, we have a, a woman in the board, and we have uh, black people in the um, in the company, yeah, but one or two, or, or at the end, uh, not more than ten percent are in uh, majority minority uh, groups. So uh, it's not about uh, having one or two. It's about that everyone with the capabilities can can take the position. So uh, when I've been working in the, in the diversity and inclusion um, process or um, building the area, some of the board of director members said, well, we'd, if we want to be inclusive, we don't need an inclusive um, area because there's a, that's a sign that you are um, that you that you are not uh, inclusive. So they think that uh, it's about to hire one or two um, people of each uh, minority group. So with that, that's okay. And the thing is that uh, at the end you don't need the the ERG groups or you don't need the uh, I don't know how to say good discrimination. Yeah. Because positive sometimes, yeah, sometimes you have to apply good discrimination, like um, in the previous lecture, that uh, if it's the same thing, you need to give the opportunity to the, um, to the one that is in uh, vulnerability position. So uh, what about if the other people, it's always in the other side and uh, never gives and never takes the opportunity because um, always is given to a human, to an African American people, to a man with disability, and and then he gets discriminated for being in in regular position. So um, we need to see that uh, this is not about uh, reputation. This is about to change the, the whole point of view of the companies, but not, not just um, about our companies, it's about the whole society because the, the company is formed out, uh, the company is formed for uh, people and the people is not all day in the, in the company, the people goes to their house on, or in this um, time, of, of COVID, uh, we have a lot of um, home office. So uh, we need to translate our, um, our corporate um, culture to our house. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we are the same at, uh, in the, all the things we do. You cannot be a good employee if you are not a good father you cannot be a good father if you are not a good neighbor. So you need to, to add all your roles in the society and be uh, open to diversity and inclusion, not just in your work, but in your house, in the, in the store, uh, or in the, with um, people that works in the government. You know, um, there were a lot of problems with um, with people that works in the health uh, uh, industry because uh, 
you know, it's, I, I'm going to get infected. Go out if you live um, near my house. So uh, we cannot ask for good uh, health service if we are um, not inclusive with the, with the medical people that lives near us. So it's the same with, it's, it's the same thing with everything. So uh, we are always said that the policy is not good and there's a lot of, um, or, bad, or, or, or bad people in the government and everything. But at, at some point we will need um, those services and, and we will need to get um, some service from those people. So we, we need to, to change our unconscious bias to be open that uh, everyone is a uh, uh, part of the society, so. Brilliant. And I'm curious, for the bigger organizations, you've mentioned Mercedes-Benz, for example. Is it easier for the bigger organizations in Mexico to include people? Yeah, because um, they have um, less risk than the small organizations. I would say that uh, international uh, corporations are the ones that I take in the risk for include people because, um, because they want more, um, uh, how can I say? They want more um, acceptation of the minorities. So uh, they are doing this. I don't know which one is the deepest reason why they do it, but uh, sometimes you have benefits with uh, taxes. You have um, a lot of benefits with reputation and everything. And then um, they... That's, what the, that's why they start with diversity and inclusion. But you cannot ask uh, the little store or the little business to, to hire people with disabilities if, if they don't have uh, money to pay um, the bills or the rent or everything. So I think that uh, in countries like Mexico, uh, bigger organizations, are the ones that uh, can take the risk and can give the example to other organizations. Mm. And I know that in Mexico, there's a lot of family businesses. What ways does it work in family businesses? Well, it depends on what family businesses, but um, sometimes it's very hard to compete with, with big organizations because big organizations can assume a lot of uh, risks and um, can um, be supported by the headquarters in other countries. So not always uh, big businesses, I don't want to give names, but uh, not always big businesses give uh, development in some um, small communities. It's because, uh, um, for give you an example, big uh, grocery stores like supermarkets goes to a small village and then with all uh, small uh, businesses and then they go there with uh, lower prices and then um, the, all the small businesses go out of business because they cannot compete and then uh, the bigger one prices their prices, and then the people doesn't have money to to buy the things, and there's um, there's no development in the community. Uh, one of the I, I always think I always say is that um, Mexico is not a pure um, it's not a pure country. It's a it's unequal because as you might know, we have um, one of the richest men of the world and everything, 
But um, the thing is that I said that uh, not everyone has the opportunity to study and uh, almost like 70% uh, of the population earn less than $400 per month. So if you wanna be middle class, you have to earn like uh, 1,050, um, $1,015, I don't, uh, and then per person. And if you earn just um, eight, 800, do almost all day, 80% of the um, uh, population in Mexico is low class. And uh, the first thing of discrimination here in Mexico is the, the zone where you live. So if you live on a, uh, high class uh, part of the city, you can go, uh, you, you are like, um, have uh, more self-esteem and you are uh, better seen in the, in the workplaces and everything. And uh, if you live in a um, lower class place, it's like, uh, well, he lives there because he's lazy. He lives there because he's lazy and he has no um, like uh, ambition to get out of there. And uh, it's very hard to, to have a, a place or a home in a, in a high standing um, neighborhood. So um, most of, of all the people doesn't know that. And when I give a lecture or everything, um, People said, no, we're not, uh, we don't have discrimination but about that. But yes, we do. And then uh, it's like uh, the university. If you have gone to a public school, uh, you don't have the chance to have a, a good um, work since the beginning. And that if you go to a good uh, school, you have a better work in the beginning and then you uh, go up faster than the one that it might have uh, better capabilities and everything, but uh, it's because he he went to a public school. He started um, below the other one that that went to a private school. So mm -hmm. it's a real big issue, and it's part of the things that I. Um, Try to implement it like uh, um, the previous uh, the previous talk that I said that uh, don't look to the to the university. So it's bringing back about fifteen years ago when I did my PhD. It was about social reproduction or opportunity. So are things. For example, the people from certain areas, when people see their address on their application, it isn't looked at in the same way as other more affluent areas. So that inhibits opportunity. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's just so, so interesting. So shall we check with the audience if anyone's got any questions for you? I could honestly chat to you all day because it's just I mean, Kurt's nodding there. It's an amazing subject. I also want to read some of the things that are in the chat box. So we've got from Samira, even a small country like Bahrain, a uh, little above 600 kilometers, people are discriminate, discriminated based on their geography, the location of where they're from. And it's only 600 kilometers, the size of the country, and it still goes on. Uh, there's people, Jean Paolo, saying uh, great quotes, great um, knowledge. And Dr. Mohammed says, exporting our products abroad and exporting our culture to our houses, which is beautiful. And then just above this, what have we got? We've got um, Ola Carido. I don't pronounce <laughs> Spanish yeah, I understand Ola anyway Carido. <laughs> and then um what else have we got there 
we've got we had comments about the way things are systemic in terms of the um peter hawkins so talks about wide angled empathy so it's not just empathy in terms of what we know and are aware of but to be able to step back and look at empathy even wider to the things that we've had no experience of is something that's been brought up in the chat box there. So anyone, any questions for Juan Pablo? I have a question, Claire. Rom, thank you. Is it now morning time where you are, Rom? Yes. <laughs> it's, uh, I can see, I'm going five. to bed soon for a few <laughs> hours. I can see the sun shining in behind you. Isn't the world a fabulous no, it's, place? It's an, it's an artificial light. I, have, uh... <laughs> ah, I thought it was the sunshine. Uh, it's 4.37 uh, a.m. in the Philippines. Beautiful. Now. Rom, <laughs> ask your question. Yes, uh... JP, in your bio, you mentioned that uh, uh, you have coordinated donations to the third sector for more than $50 million. Could you please uh, elaborate further about this accomplishment? Well, I'm going to give a couple of money. So, <laughs> uh, well, in, in places like Mexico and uh, Latin America, some of the strategies to, to generate um, development is to give donations and uh, make programs for the NGOs and everything. So uh, I think that uh, volunteering work, uh, it's a very nice way to look outside of our box and uh, to help other people to other people to uh, develop their um, their capabilities and uh, have more self esteem. Let me give you an example. When I was in Mercedes, uh, we had a robotic uh, team that. Uh, worked uh, there was there was um um i don't know how to say when you a competition a uh, global competition for uh robotics and everything for uh little kids in the uh, uh, um, not elementary school but uh the other one in um middle school they were in middle school before um university and everything and uh, we decide to uh, to support a, a team from a school that uh, was near the um, the plant so when when we got to the competition they were uh, a lot of private schools and uh, all these kids um, went to the competition with the fans of the name of schools uh, and uh, all the other rich kids were looking at them like uh, oh you are poor you are not going to to have a good performance in the competition but but uh, when they took off when they took off their jacket there was like a Daimler t-shirt with uh, all the Mercedes logos and everything and all the kids were astonished because they were asked um, for a, I don't know how to say, um, sponsorship. They were asking for a sponsorship to us and we decided to give the sponsorship to the ones that, need, needed, that um, needed the most. So um, one of the things is that uh, in those occasions, the result, you don't ask for the result. You, you just ask for the effort and eventually the result would get there. So uh, when you start working with vulnerable, vulnerable people, you need to ask for the effort. And uh, after 10 years, there will be results or after a year or everything. And um, 
in that occasion, there were like uh, 40 schools and we were in third place. And uh, so if you give opportunities uh, in, uh, in certain, uh, after some time, you will find that uh, all the people, the only thing they need, it's an opportunity. So uh, as you asked me since the beginning, um, I'm here because I want to open uh, the way from the people that uh, comes back so they will have the same opportunity that I have because um, they will, uh, uh, they always um, tell me that I, I have a very success career and uh, how I did it. And I said, well, I, I didn't do anything. I just uh, knock in the right door. So, uh, um, I just knock, knock in the right door and they open, but uh, not, not just only open it, they let me in. So um, the strategy in donations to answer the, the question is that uh, we need to invest in uh, projects that uh, in certain time, they, they uh, give us uh, development and opens to opportunity in the in the location the the organization operates thank you jp you're welcome you're on mute claire you're on mute yeah thank you Ron will be speaking with his team tomorrow. We're starting 6 a.m. my time with Dr. Lawrence Brown, who's in Pakistan, and he's talking about the radical changes needed in the curriculum to support EDI. And then we move on to Ron, who actually is a volunteer. He runs a charity in the Philippines, Joanne, for disabilities. So he will be bringing on people to talk about the impact of having a disability and the way it has positively and sometimes negatively impacted their lives. So we've got a very interesting session tomorrow as well. Anyone, any other questions for Joanne? I'm sorry, I'm probably not pronouncing your name perfectly. The J would be pronounced with an H. Juan. Juan, yes. <laughs> Any more questions? I was saying that you can call me JP if you want. Ah, oh, that's so much easier for a British person. <laughs> Gracias. <laughs> so, I've got one question. If there was three top tips that you could give an organization for them to get on the right path to inclusion, what would those three top tips be? Well, um, you can always be kind. You can always, if you don't know what to do, smile. Uh, if you don't know what to do, ask. If you don't have anything to ask, you have to smile and uh, for uh, the third thing is that uh, if it, uh, le le let me tell you, the best time, uh, we have to start now. The best time to start is uh, start now because now is the, the best time for everything. And uh, if it's not me, who? And uh, if it's not now, when? And uh, if it's not with love, how? So, uh, those were uh, three points that I, I want to share with you for close this uh, talk. Fabulous. So I want to really share my appreciation with you giving up the time and sharing with us something that's personal, vulnerable, but also so passionate. And what I love about everything you said is the positivity and the fact that little steps, if we all take them, can have a massive transformational impact. Thank you. Would anyone else like to say any closing words to thank Joanne? 
Juan. JP. <laughs> JP. Yeah. I know there's a lot of appreciation in the chat box. Wow, amazing. Passionate and positive. Thank you. Muchas yeah, gracias. Thank you, thank you, Juan. I just really appreciated it. I just loved your talk. Um, Who's talking? Pardon me? My name is Who's Kurt. Who's talking? Kurt. Uh, hi, Kurt. Hi, how yeah. are you? Yeah, the world, I, I used to work at the World Bank and about, I guess it was in 2004, they had a disabilities coordinator uh, named Judith Human, And I think um, she really kind of put disability awareness on the map in development projects. Um, and I know that they've, uh, at the, that it also had a rippling effect down on the, the work of, um, I mean, on staff. Uh, and so they have very active disability engagement programs. Um, and I like what you said at the beginning, you know, at some point, one of the things that she said always struck with me is like, you know, sooner or later, we're all gonna be, have a disability as we get older and older and older. And so, you know, it's, it's, we can't be selfish about this because it's not even in our own interest. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you so much for that message. No, thanks for watching and uh, for stay after your awesome participation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So today we have had in total We've had 11 sessions. We've had 14 speakers from eight locations around the world as we've moved backwards. Tomorrow.